This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Thanks to everyone who makes the show possible, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and Reed Fishler. Coming up on DTNS, why has AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton still talking to the press after a week straight? The Imager Download Caper aims to save images on Meme Factory something awful, and we try to figure out why streaming TV apps have such awful UI. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, May 8th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. Deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Ah, folks, Twitter says it's going to purge your account if you've been inactive for several years. But we'll let you know if they give out any more specifics on, you know, how long or anything like that. Let's start off today's show, though, with the quick hits. Qualcomm's automotive unit made up Uh, A little less than 5% of the company's revenue in Q2. But Qualcomm has big plans for the business. Uh, The company announced it acquired the Israeli fabless chip maker Autotox, makers of an auto communication safety tech platform called V2X, or Vehicle to Everything. Qualcomm plans to integrate V2X into its Snapdragon digital chassis offerings. Liechtenstein Prime Minister Daniel Riesch told the German newspaper Handelsbot that the company plans to accept Bitcoin as payment for state services. Any coins it receives will be immediately converted to Swiss francs. The country, which, as a reminder, has no debt and runs a surplus every year, also will continue to consider whether to invest its surplus into crypto assets. Although Riesch said it's too risky now, that may change. Liechtenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Baidu announced its Xiaodu smart home unit will de- debut its first smartphone next week. Smartphone. Uh, up until now, Xiaodu has only made smart speakers and smart displays running Baidu's Duer OS voice platform. Baidu said the phone will help build out its hardware ecosystem to complement its existing services. One wonders if the absence of Huawei on the scene as much as it used to be might help. Uh, this does come as the Chinese smartphone market is contracting. Counterpoint Research estimates sales in the country fell 5% on the year in Q1. Uh, that is the lowest sales in the quarter since 2014. While we wait for the glorious day, pass keys uh, will replace passwords. Multi-factor authentication still the best way on the books to bolster password security. As it becomes more common, phishing attacks that try to trick you into giving up your second factor have become more sophisticated. They're arising to meet the challenge. So Microsoft is introducing number matching in its authenticator app. How it works, when number matching is enabled, the site will show you a code of its own that must be entered into the Authenticator app. Then you get the code from the Authenticator to enter on the website. That way, you're more certain you're entering your second factor on the correct site and not being fished. It's a pretty common vector to get oh your two gosh, factors. Just bring on the pass keys, please. <laughs> uh, Android has a system to kill background apps to save battery and improve performance, which is great, but manufacturers all set their own parameters, so it's not consistent across models. And sometimes they get a touch aggressive at killing you know, your contact sync or something. So Google is working with partners to reduce how often background apps are killed and keep things consistent across Android 14 manufacturers. Samsung is putting its hand up to be the first partner committed to implementing the new system with One UI 6.0 coming out later this year. Folks, in many ways, we're starting to see the normalization of generative AI. It's becoming just a part of the life. Uh, Large language models, yeah, everybody's talking about them. Look no further than a recent Hacker News thread asking why ChatGPT cannot build a simple website from scratch. Hey, look, we found a limit. Uh, Another sign is that the security community is making sure this is part of the rigmarole. DEF CON, the security conference, is going to have a collaborative event in its AI village to pit thousands of students and researchers into finding flaws in LLM. That's what you do at DEF CON. You find flaws in the popular stuff. LLMs have made it. And as, uh, as, you know, AI kind of gets normalized and and we're we're talking about it in kind of different avenues, the media is certainly uh, keeping pace with that. And one person that has come to loom large in that conversation is definitely AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton. Of course, last Monday, we talked about I was leaving Google in part to be able to speak more freely about concerns with AI development. That kicked off with a New York Times interview. That's, uh, you know, a pretty standard place to start. Granted, you expect a few other outlets to get interviews after that but the parade has been fairly consistent. 
Friday, Reuters posted an interview with Hinton, and Monday, there was a new one up on Wired. He's all over the media. So, Justin, why do you think uh, Jeffrey Hinton is getting this uh, extended media tour? Quite simply because reporters keep calling him if we want to be super reductive about it. Uh, <laughs> sure. Why does he keep picking up? I guess it would then be the next question. Yeah. If, if people keep sending you emails and asking you questions or asking to get on the phone and you keep doing it, then you're going to keep having articles written about you. I think we often have a little bit more of a managed media perspective on this when quite simply it's usually this kind of answer. Now, why are reporters calling him? Why are editors assigning reporters to this kind of story that leads them to Hinton quite simply because Hinton has proven himself to be a guy who says the thing this happens throughout all media, but I would say if, if for sports fans and please keep up with me. If, if this is not, I'll do my best to explain it. One of the best teams of all time was the Chicago bulls back in the nineties. They had two great players, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen periodically for oftentimes no reason whatsoever, Scottie Pippen will be the guy who says the thing. The thing being Michael Jordan wasn't all that good. This player or that player would have been better. This becomes a 24-hour media cycle because blaspheming Michael Jordan is sacrilegious, and we move on after everybody gets their Under Armour ads uh, uh, you know, played next to content that people want to watch. Hinton is similar to that in that right now we are in a very unsettled and explosive time for AI. So if there's somebody that has pedigree, like Scotty Pippen, and will say a thing that is either confirmatory or negating very strongly held priors, then it will get traction. Uh, uh, further than that, I think Hinton was very much a, a, a phase in AI research that was extraordinarily academic and extraordinarily theoretical. Yes, he was part of uh, the, the GPT uh, uh, creation at Google, but Right now, we're in a different meta, and the meta is product-based because OpenAI made ChatGPT, and that's what gave people a handle on all this, and that's what calling all the causing all the kerfuffle. Yeah, that that that's a good explanation of why the media is is interested, and a good pointer towards what I'm wondering, which is what is Hinton getting out of this? Uh, is because I imagine Scotty Pippen had different motivations for speaking up than Jeffrey Hinton might, uh, and and I wonder like. It doesn't seem like he's got a book that he's going to put up. Maybe he does. Uh, he certainly doesn't need to well, make now. a name for himself. He's 75 years old and considered a founding father of AI. I guess everybody could use a little more press, but that that's what I wonder is, is it just that he honestly is stunned by how fast this stuff has turned after spending an entire career watching it move slowly? That could be enough to, to jar someone into wanting to talk. Uh, or is there some other motivation there? I have, I don't know. I mean, I think it's certainly is, listen, I have this, I have this moment, I have this platform, you know, Justin, to your point, who knows how long the, not just this media tour, but like the fact that, oh, well, will a, you know, reporter take his call to get a story out there or something like that, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, he has this platform and he definitely seems to be using it for all of its worth to get out a lot of his concerns. And I also think to make nuanced points more than you could in just one times interview where oh, he seems to be genius at that, right? Yeah. He's where he'll be like, like each outlet this is worse something. than climate change. Well, hold on, let me tell you. And then if you read the story, he's very reasonable about that, but he's great at the, the, the little nut graph quote that's going to catch your attention. Yeah. And we, yeah, and the wired things, he kind of outlined a little bit more of, of, of a lot of the stuff he was alluding to in the New York Times. And some of that is just that outlet is a better place to get into nuts and bolts versus a time interview. But, you know, I, I, I think it's uh, part of the motivation is realizing, like, listen, I'm going to have one. I, I probably have one media cycle before, you know, uh, uh, text to video comes out and everybody's obsessed with that or, or something else consumes the but why the does he want to have a media cycle in the first place is my question. I, I, think, I, I think that that if you have seen throughout the world of ai research the one thing that has been consistent is that everybody takes this very seriously that they have dedicated the time and effort and research to, based on the idea that AI can be something extraordinarily dangerous. So the idea that Hinton is putting that forward is not shocking to me. That, that to me seems to have been the baseline throughout all of this. And that's why the fact that it had not 
you know, popped off and maybe the way that it has recently was not looked at as the, the worst thing because the operative phrase, and this is skimming off of, of, you know, stuff that's been put out there publicly is better safe than sorry when it comes to AI. Well, guess yeah. what? It's moving now. And there's going to be some people that are scared. I mean, I, th- I think he might. Uh, it might just be as simple as he legitimately is concerned. Uh, Lion Jim Video has a has a point. Uh, he wants to talk until he hears his message spoken correctly. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> though, if it's exactly that so much as he wants to make sure the nuance of his message gets out there. So doing multiple interviews is a, gives him more shots at that. I, 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 I will also say this. If you look at the media landscape in terms of who is the voice that the media is turning to when it comes to to AI discussions, but up until now, I would say it would be OpenAI's Sam Altman, the CEO, you know, uh, of there. When we're looking for like those those banger quotes that are, are going to be leading off something like that, and he I, and I think th- there's the perspective of obviously by far not a disinterested party, very much in favor of hey, the thing that I've oh dedicated, sure you know, yeah not, again and and him, I get why know, the media wants to talk to him. That doesn't that well, doesn't no no so but. I'm saying from like a, from a perspective of that of being like a, of a voice that can speak on every level of AI that would have both the scientific and media credibility. I I think possibly Hinton could be wanting to build that up in terms of so it's not just voices of people that are leading companies telling us why this is not a problem. He's the loyal opposition, if you will, a, a, something along those lines. Hmm. Well, Imager announced on uh, April 19th that it has new terms of service coming into effect May. 15th, mark your calendars, and it will then remove all nudity, pornography, and sexually explicit content from its platform, as well as old, unused, and inactive content that is not tied to a user account. And that's a lot of content that's linked all over the web, could cause a whole bunch of issues. And The Verge's Addie Robertson profiled how users and owner, uh, the users and owner of the long-running comedy site, Something Awful, are starting to address that with the... Uh, uh, with the uh, imager download caper to preserve these images before they disappear. So, Justin, give us the facts. How are they doing this? I'm glad you asked, Rich. It's a three-step process. Number one, scrape something awful and parse out the 100,000 imager links and addresses. Two, divide up the downloading and keep track in a spreadsheet. Most of this is done now. Uh, step three, however, is just beginning. Three, host the images and overwrite previous links to post to the new host this is not a new problem there have been images disappearing from Flickr and image shack and projects like archive.org and the rogue archive team continually fight to preserve things like this so tom is this the best the internet can do yeah apparently because we've gone through this over and over again uh i i'm curious if this will be the time or if we're going to need to do it a few more times before someone really uh, gathers the troops together to do some sort of open source uh, way of, of archiving images, whether we can get archive.org to, to be a little looser on on hosting images. They do host images on archive.org, uh, but w- with the with the Wayback Machine, they haven't always gone back and archived everything. I don't know in this case if Imager was, was making that more difficult than it needs to be or something, but it sounds like they were able to scrape them themselves on something awful. But but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll throw out the world decentralized because I'm sure someone else will, but whether it's decentralized or something else, it does feel like we are finally moving into a realm where the internet is... 20 to 30 years old. And that means that if we're not paying attention, we are going to lose some of our culture if we don't have better methods for dealing with something like this. Now, granted, uh, in in previous times, like GeoCities and other stuff, folks have banded together and figured out how to do some preservation, but with varying results, I guess the other question is, is it important? And maybe it's not. Maybe that's why we don't have uh, anything but a mad scramble every time something like this comes up. Well, well, and that's definitely like imagers opinion, right? It's like, oh, this is this is either unimportant or it's potentially libel inducing content that or, you know, like we, we could be facing some legislation. I would not say libel, but, you know, could could cost us some money to keep serving this content up. They recently changed ownership. So I, like I can see it from their perspective of even if this is significant for Internet culture, uh, we don't want to foot the bill for that. But the uh, well, I don't think that's why they did it, though. It, it seems quite the opposite. Uh, well, I guess imager uh, did it that way. I'm sorry. Something awful seems to be 
willing to fit the bill. Is I guess what Wait, I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, but but from imagers' and they perspective, make less you're, money. Saying, <laughs> you're saying you're saying if it's something we deem to be of value, and I, I'm just saying from imagers' perspective, I don't yeah, think yeah, they yeah, necessarily yeah. deem that for value for them. Uh, again, they have to operate their own business, but I, I think this does mark like a transition that we're seeing of sites, you know, building off of like exclusively linked content. Now, now, granted, Reddit still exists, which is, you know, the the king of all of this and certainly will be impacted by this as well. But I, I think the solution to this is if you're going to do a site like something awful, you, you start it with a service level agreement for some sort of image storage and you're not linking out. Now, again, something awful is is old in internet time uh so i'm that's I'm not, a very so, enterprisey take <laughs> yes. for a forum like something awful. Yes. i know it's like pay you know I, I i'm sorry but it's like a site like imager i'm sure in there it said we can delete this content at any time you have no right yes, you know like and yes and yes and <laughs> the promise of imager was literally the thing that they are now deleting and and going back on and yes it's new management but part of the reason why imager became popular online was because you could just upload something without creating a username which meant you could post spicier stuff or stuff just flat out quicker and just get it on the the message board that you wanted message boards evolved to take advantage of this kind of stuff now maybe we look at a new meta of how stuff like this is going forward but this is a change in imagers uh, uh, profile and reputation the same profile and reputation that led them to be an industry standard for stuff like this. As for a solution in terms of archiving, I'm very glad that they were able to bootstrap it at something awful, but I almost wonder whether or not there should be either colloquially, if not mandated for big purges like this, just a, a statement of things that are about to go away. So there can be for anybody interested an easier clearing house to determine Here's what I want. I, I think I, it, I think fewer things are leaving Imager than than people expect because it's inactive, non account associated. So if you had an account, it's not going away, and it has to have been not accessed by anyone in a long time. Um, so I'm I'm curious what's actually going to disappear there. Well, but but that's but that's that's the content that made it famous, like like the no user account uploaded stuff. Yeah, like, but even the actively uh, accessed non user account stuff is staying. It's but, only the stuff that no one's accessed in a while. I, I, and, and I understand that we don't know what the tragedy is until somebody looks for a thing and it's gone. Mm. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, good yes, point. Your, 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 your point is clear. And then somebody's going to look for that one Photoshop Friday thing and it's not going to be there and the world will cry. Yeah. The first cheeseburger is mm -hmm. gone into the ether. Uh, well, folks, if you are feeling social, uh, you might want to follow us on the social medias because uh, if you miss an episode, Joe has been working hard to post shorts, like some of the best clips out of an episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Uh, Zoe has been taking those and putting them up on TikTok uh, and Instagram as well. So get out there and follow us. We're at daily tech news show on TikTok. We're at DTNS picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter and Mastodon as well at DTNS show on both of those. <laughs> Fast Company posted an article Monday by Jesus Diaz called From Netflix to HBO, the terrible design of streaming is ruining TV. Some of the complaints listed in the article include the terrible landing page that tells you nothing uh, that you want to see when you land on an app, the hard to find continue watching that's, you know, down scrolling several pages to get to it. Uh, Apple and Hulu got called out specifically for that. Disappointing recommendation algorithms, playback button failure, scrubbing imprecision where it's harder than, as Jesus Diaz said, playing Tetris with your feet to actually scrub to the point in a video that you want. Diaz interviewed some UX experts to get some idea of why these designs are so bad. Uh, he says it appears to be down to the old tension between how a business needs its user to behave, which is to watch new stuff, and what a user wants to do, which is watch the stuff they're interested in. Hours watched is more important to a company than series completion. They don't care if you finish the series. They just want you to watch a lot of different things. So they make you go past new options to get to the continue watching, for example. Uh, it's also hard for the UX to keep up as business strategies change. And this has been an extremely fast moving uh, business over the past several years. Justin, uh, when you think about a streaming service, what do you want most to improve your experience as a viewer? 
I want to click continue watching and have it be the new episode and not last week's episode. Oh my gosh. Which yeah. Happen every single time I try to watch Succession. Uh, I mean, what do I want? I want for them to be able to almost seamlessly keep playing the thing that I was last watching on their platform. I want to know what my friends are watching or know whether or not the hot show that everybody is talking about is on this platform. And I want it to play in the highest resolution possible. So the last thing seems to happen fairly regularly. What is a problem is I think the television specific user interfaces for these services, because mobile, I don't think it's all that bad. And, and part of that goes into the mentality psychologically of if I see nine buttons on a touch screen, I don't think, oh, nine buttons. I just press the button I want. If I see nine buttons on my uh, television in my living room, I'm like, scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh, no, it thought that down scroll was side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The remotes are also a problem. Nine is a lot. Like that is walking a gauntlet. So it feels more onerous there. And I, I have sympathy for the designers because they got to design for a lot of stuff. But still, it is ponderous and annoying. Yeah, I, I, to build off of that, the design challenge here, I, I, I don't want to say it's insurmountable. I mean, because we have good design tech products. Part of it is the business model of this is something that people are consuming. So they have an interest in you like consuming it. It's not something you you use there's there's a there's a dynamic there between consumption and use I, I i'm not making this extraordinarily clear but the fact that these designers you have different use modalities right use modalities versus someone sitting on their couch watching it on their phone versus someone sitting with a laid-back experience watching it on tv they have different hardware requirements where you can have an you know a relatively recent you know apple chip in your apple tv versus your roku that could be you know running six-year-old low power arm silicon like there's 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 so many different needles that they need to thread all within the mandate of, you know, uh, of overall branding with teams that we don't, you know, the odds are these teams are working entirely separately and stuff like that. So I have, I do have some sympathy for the technical challenges. This is not easy. So I, I, I don't want to throw designers under the bus because I know design are, is hard is what yeah, you're saying. Design, and I think that's a totally fair point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is extraordinarily hard. Uh, that being said, I mean, like TV design has always been, feels like something reviled i mean from like thinking back to like the old guide on well, sure. cable tv and stuff like in, that right? in the old days the cable company didn't have to design for you because you didn't have a choice you were going to watch cable or nothing so what do they care uh we have the opposite problem here where everyone is scrambling to get your eyeballs so the pressures are and this is always true when you're when you're in a resource constrained environment uh customer satisfaction always gets pressured to suffer a little bit for business propositions there's always a little bite yeah but can we make them do this and with the amount of intense competition in streaming with everybody jumping into the pool at once that's why suddenly you see so much pressure to make you watch things rather than to present to you the easy way to watch the things you want to i think that will get better as consolidation happens over the next couple of years and as things calm down and you you start to see oh these are the businesses that are working they'll start to settle down and focus more on design and stop changing things so often and having having mergers and splits and changes of content and all of that. I, 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 do, I do think that there's a reality though to this, which is you will stay on a platform when you have watched a thing that you are waiting for the next season of. And so they therefore want you to scratch as many of those mm -hmm. lottery tickets as possible. So you are always waiting for a new thing that you would like to see more content. Of. So that, that incentive I think will never change. And and the idea that because these are all these all these streaming platforms, many of these streaming platforms are powered by exclusive content, right? So the UI just has to be bad enough that you don't rage quit something, and you'll say, oh, I'll "Put up with Amazon Prime Video and, and and so I can watch the boys or what you know whatever the show may be." You'll put up with it as long as it is not like 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 beat your head against the wall bad. Where I think there might actually be a chance for some UI innovation. And we probably see this the most in uh, like over the top 
like you know uh, cable replacement services right is uh, these these tons of these services where we're seeing free ad supported content you know kind of linear tv style where a lot of like a lot of those are serving up the exact same channels it's like the, every time a new one is announced we have 500 channels they're all exactly the same as almost everything else and so how do you differentiate that you differentiate that with like annoyance of ads or with UI basically, or like what platforms you're locked into and that kind of stuff. So I think that's the part where maybe we will have seen motivation to make UI significantly better. Yeah. And, and just, just not feeling the intense, like breakneck rush to succeed, I think will help as well. All right. Well, earlier this year, an update to Google Assistant added the ability to stop alarms without using its wake word. I use this all the time. You could just say, stop. Well, a user on Reddit wondered why they keep missing alarms, having them shut off quickly. It seemed very inconsistent. They couldn't figure it out, did some research, and they were using the classic Pixie song, Where Is My Mind, for their alarm. If you're not familiar with it, it starts out with lead singer Black Francis saying, stop. The band's official account tweeted out, sorry about that. So at least that's yeah. something. So, so anybody who hasn't heard the Pixies, here is the very beginning of this song. Okay, so imagine uh, the alarm goes off at uh, 7 a.m. and you get this. Stop. <laughs> and then your alarm stops. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, uh, uh, many people will know this as the song from the end of Fight Club, uh, the song that was briefly the theme song for AEW wrestler Orange Cassidy. Uh, a very, very popular, probably the most iconic Pixie song of all time, but apparently not a good solution if you're trying to get up bright and early in the morning. <laughs> well, and I, I'm with you, Rich. You were we were talking earlier today, and you were like, "Why, why don't these uh, d d these these speakers, these smart speakers, have a system that lets them know when the sound is coming from inside the speaker?" Right? Yeah, just put something way below audible hearing. Some I. They have to have something like that. I'm sure they use it for ad tech or other stuff. Like, put it in there to stop. There's the, stop. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it was similar, like, like stop in the name of love or, or anything. They, no, there's got to be a song where, where this is right at the beginning. <laughs> like, uh, they, they actually, they <laughs> tested out a bunch of different songs. Uh, uh, Gadget did, and they did not find uh, that that was the case. It was like, just because this was, there's like really no backing music to it. It's just yeah. like a spoken word, not sung, turned out. All right. Well, that's enough talking about this. Let's stop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and check out the mailbag. Indeed. Uh, Damon wrote in regarding the Grasp search engine. That's the one that lets you pick sites from which to build its search index. And we talked about it, of course, uh, on our show on Friday. And he said, over the years, we have been talking about getting out of our information bubble, but this is the exact tool to reinforce it. I made the decision to choose sites that I felt were unbiased and trustworthy. However, some may choose to only follow and add sites that play loose with the facts and rely heavily on conspiracy theories. Like any tool, it's all in how you use it. Yeah, you're not the first person, Damon, or, or I should say that you're not the only person uh, to, to bring up this idea with, with Grasp, um, to which I say, sure, and that's worse than what we have now by how much percent? Like, yeah. I still feel like uh, if you're trying to fix all of humanity with Grasp, no, it won't work. Uh, but if you're giving us individuals a tool with which we could, uh, you know, better manage the information we see, then then I think it's it's useful. I, I don't believe that you can out engineer certain elements of our humanity. Right. Right. This is, this is a tool. It is in the way that you use it. It comes in a cut. Yeah. Well, well put. Uh, although now you have to stop. Okay. <laughs> it's in the board now. Watch out. <laughs> uh, Shaddy from Egypt wrote in and said, I was listening to DTNS episode four, five Oh two. When I heard the mention of Microsoft Tanta, uh, which is a, a code name for one of their new Surface products. Then a few seconds later, we hear about the Luxor Surface Pro. And at this point, I felt compelled to pause and write you this email. Looks like for some weird reason, there's an obsession in Microsoft to code name projects after Egyptian cities. Tanta is the fifth largest city in Egypt, and it's a few kilometers north of Cairo. Remember Project Cairo from Microsoft? Uh, yeah, what is, what is that about? I think Shadi has, has got a good question here. Uh, I, it's not unusual to take regions of the world and, and name things after a yeah. did it with rivers and stuff. So, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, especially in terms of gigantic family trees of products and stuff like that, there's 
probably a very uh, a cogent reason why Egypt is being used as an inspirational family of uh, uh, you know a family of products for 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 Microsoft. But much in the same way that Apple would name all of their OSs after various different natural wonders right. in California and stuff like that, this is just a way that they can signify internally this is these are all connected we are we are continuing to populate a map as it were of of these products yeah so you would not tell them to Stop. okay <laughs> uh no no i would say tanta jump on it <laughs> Ah, uh, Justin Robert Young, you're the best. Thank you for being with us as always. Uh, congratulations on bringing World's Greatest Con in for a landing. What an excellent season. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, World's Greatest Con Project Alpha, our uh, deep dive into one of the most fascinating stories from the late 70s and early 80s. Two teenagers flummoxed academics who had $4 million in today's money worth of funding to try to find actual psychics. They fooled the researchers. Turns out they were just doing magic tricks. Please listen to the entire series, all six episodes. They are now available for the first time. So if you've been waiting to binge, Ali Ali Oxenfree, season three of World's Greatest Con. All right. We want to thank also our brand new bosses. It's the best way to start out a Monday. Gets us off on the right foot. And we got three new bosses, Ian. JB and Stanislaus backing us on Patreon. Truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, JB. And thank you, Stanislaus. Hey, everybody, get over here. Welcome, Ian, JB, and Stanislaus in. Uh, it's good to have you all. The patrons gather around, say hi, pat them on the back, stick around. Ian, JB, and Stanislaus, good day. Internet comes to the patrons on a private RSS feed. We're going to be talking about the glowing review that The Verge's Monica Chin gave to the $279 Gateway Lab laptop and what a cheap laptop might mean for the slumping pc market stick around remember you can catch the show live monday through friday at 4 p.m eastern 2000 utc find out more head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we'll be back tomorrow talking spatial audio with patrick norton see you then this show is part of the frog pants network Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Stop.